phytoplankton draw nearly as much CO2 out of the oceans and atmosphere as all land plants do. Consequently, in vast areas of the open ocean, far removed from land, the concentration of this critical element seldom exceeds 0.2 part per billion AFD to 100 the concentrations of phosphate or XED in organic nitrogen. Historical evidence buried in layers of ice from Antarctica also supported Martin's hypothesis. The Vostok ice core, a record of the past 420,000 years of the Earth's history, implied that during ice ages the amount of iron was much higher and the average size of the dust particles was significantly larger than during warmer times. These endings suggest that the continents were dry and wind speeds were high during glacial periods, thereby injecting more iron and dust into the atmosphere than during wetter interglacial times. Martin and other investigators also noted that when dust was high, CO2 was low, and vice versa. This correlation implied that increased delivery of iron to the oceans during peak glacial time stimulated both nitrogen's ashen and phytoplankton's use of nutrients. The resulting rise in phytoplankton productivity could have enhanced the biological pump, thereby pulling more CO2 out of the atmosphere. The dramatic response of phytoplankton to changing glacial conditions took place over thousands of years, but Martin wanted to know whether smaller changes could make a difference in a matter of days. In 1993 Martin's colleagues conducted the world's RST open ocean manipulation experiment by adding iron directly to the equatorial PASIC. Their research ship carried tanks containing a few hundred kilograms of iron dissolved in dilute sulfuric acid and slowly released the solution as it traversed a 50 square kilometer patch of ocean like a lawnmower. The outcome of this RST experiment was promising but inconclusive, in part because the seafaring scientists were able to schedule only about a week to watch the phytoplankton react. When the same group repeated the experiment for four weeks in 1995, the results were clear, the additional iron dramatically increased phytoplankton photosynthesis, leading to a bloom of organisms that colored the waters green. Since then, three independent groups, from New Zealand, Germany, and the US, have demonstrated unequivocally that adding small amounts of iron to the Southern Ocean greatly stimulates phytoplankton productivity. The most extensive fertilization experiment to date took place during January and February of this year. The project, called the Southern Ocean Iron Experiment, SOFAX, and led by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and the Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, involved three ships and 76 scientists, including four of my colleagues from Rutgers. Preliminary results indicate that one ton of iron solution. 60 Scientific American August 2002 released over about 300 square kilometers resulted in a tenfold increase in primary productivity in eight weeks time. These results have convinced most biologists that iron indeed stimulates phytoplankton growth at high latitudes, but it is important to note that no one has yet proved whether this increased productivity enhanced the biological pump or increased CO2 storage in the deep sea. The most up-to-date mathematical predictions suggest that even if phytoplankton incorporated all the unused nitrogen and phosphorus in the surface waters of the Southern Ocean over the next 100 years, at most 15% of the CO2 re least during fossil fuel combustion could be sequestered. Fertilizing the ocean Despite the myriad uncertainties about purposefully fertilizing the oceans, some groups from both the private and public sectors have taken steps toward doing so on much larger scales. One company has proposed a scheme in which commercial ships that routinely traverse the Southern Pacific would release small amounts of a fertilizer mix. Other groups have discussed the possibility of piping nutrients, including iron and ammonia, directly into coastal waters to trigger phytoplankton blooms. Three American entrepreneurs have even convinced the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to issue seven patents for commercial ocean fertilization technologies, and yet another is pending. It is still unclear whether such ocean fertilization strategies will ever be technically feasible. To be effective, fertilization would have to be conducted year in and year out for decades. Because ocean circulation will eventually expose all deep waters to the atmosphere, all the extra CO2 stored by the enhanced biological pump would return to the atmosphere within a few hundreds years of the last fertilizer treatment. Moreover, 
the reach of such efforts is not easily controlled. Farmers cannot keep nutrients contained to a plot of land, fertilizing a patch of turbulent ocean water is even less manageable. For this reason, many ocean experts argue that that once initiated, large-scale fertilization could produce long-term damage that would be difficult, if not impossible, to X. Major disruptions to the marine food web are a foremost concern. Computer simulations and studies of natural phytoplankton blooms indicate that enhancing primary productivity could lead to local problems of severe oxygen depletion. The microbes that consume dead phytoplankton cells as they sink toward the CAO or sometimes consume oxygen faster than ocean circulation can replenish it. Creatures that cannot escape to more oxygen-rich waters will suffocate. Such conditions also encourage the growth of microbes that produce methane and nitrous oxide, two greenhouse gases with even greater heat trapping capacity than CO2. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, severe oxygen depletion and other problems triggered by nutrient runoff have already degraded more than half the coastal waters in the U.S., such as the infamous dead zone in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Dozens of other regions around the world are battling similar difficulties. Even if the possible unintended consequences of fertilization were deemed tolerable, any such efforts must also come. Pensate for the way plants and oceans would respond to a warmer world. Comparing satellite observations of phytoplankton abundance from the early 1980s with those from the 1990s suggests that the ocean is getting a little bit greener, but several investigators have noted that higher productivity does not guarantee that more carbon will be stored in the deep ocean. Indeed, the opposite may be true. Computer simulations of the oceans and the atmosphere have shown that additional warming will increase stratification of the ocean as fresh water from melting glaciers and sea ice oats above denser, salty seawater. Such stratification would actually slow the biological pump's ability to transport carbon from the sea surface to the deep ocean. New satellite sensors are now watching phytoplankton populations on a daily basis, and future small-scale fertilization experiments will be critical to better understanding phytoplankton behavior. The idea of designing large, commercial ocean fertilization projects to alter climate, however, is still under serious debate among the scientific community and policymakers alike. In the minds of many scientists, the potential temporary human binet of commercial fertilization projects is not worth the inevitable but unpredictable consequences of altering natural marine ecosystems. In any case, it seems ironic that society would call on modern phytoplankton to help solve a problem created in part by the burning of their fossilized ancestors. www.siam.com Scientific American 61 Peter Park's Image Quest 3D.com Triceratium. Aquatic Photosynthesis. Paul G. Fokowski and John A. Raven. Blackwell Scientific, 1997. The Global Carbon Cycle, a test of our knowledge of the Earth as a system. Paul G. Fokowski ETAL in Science, Volume 290, pages 291 to 294, October 13, 2000. The Changing Ocean Carbon Cycle, a Midterm Synthesis of the Joint Global Ocean Flux Study. Edited by Roger B. Hansen, Hugh W. Ducklow and John G. Field. Cambridge University Press, 2000. Ocean Primary Productivity Distribution Maps and Links to Satellite Imagery are located at http colon slash slash marine.rutgers.edu slash op slash index.html Details about the Southern Ocean Iron Experiment are located at www.mbari.org slash education slash cruises slash sofx2002 slash index.htm More to explore. Adding iron to the Southern Ocean greatly stimulates phytoplankton productivity.